have a seat. <laughs> wow. Worship's been incredible this morning, amen. Yeah, I mean, earlier the band was just rocking out. I thought it was awesome, amen. Yeah. You know, if you're visiting with us, we are a church that believes in changing the world for Christ. Are you with me right here, guys? And we're excited because today we're going to start a series in the book of 1 Samuel, amen. Yeah. Now, we are a Bible church. Yes, we are under the New Covenant and under the New Testament, and we praise God for Jesus Christ, amen. Yeah. And yet, to truly understand God's plan for the ages and all the truths of the Bible, you've got to know the Old Testament. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, he teaches that all of the stories of the Old Testament foreshadow and parallel the spiritual realities that we experience now as Christians. So you remember the Israelites that were under bondage under the Egyptians, slaves, and God chose Moses to deliver the people through the Red Sea. And the Bible says that's like our baptism. We came out of our slavery of our sins and Jesus delivered us. And it's going to be great to see Jess baptized into Christ. Amen. Excited for you, sis. What happened after Moses then is the people wandered in the desert. See, we think Christianity is the promised land. No, that's heaven. Amen. We are now in the desert wandering, living off the bread of life, living off the manna from heaven, journeying to our final destination. Moses, because he sinned, was not able to take the people into the promised land. And so Moses raised up another man named Joshua, amen? And you remember Joshua, the incredible military leader that conquered all the foreigners and all the, prom- all the people in the promised land and began the nation of Israel that had been promised way back in the time of Abraham, amen? amen. But then we come now after these glorious moments for God's people. After the time of Joshua, we come to the time of Judges. And Judges is a very dark time for God's people. Let's turn to Judges chapter 2. If we're going to understand 1 Samuel, we need to understand the book of Judges. Amen? I'm going to be using a series our brother Kip did back in Portland that really inspired the church and really laid the seeds that ignited the movement that we are all a part of today. Amen? We find in Judges chapter 2... In verse 6, the Bible says this. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. (laughs) Is that pretty awesome? (laughs) And they buried him in the land of his inheritance in Tamath Harris and the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served the Baal and the Ashtaroths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them. Just as he had sworn to them, they were in great distress. After Joshua and the elders died, Israel falls into prostitution. Prostitution with the gods of the foreign nations around them. And the Bible says they fall away from God. The question comes, did God still love his people? Absolutely. Yes. But were they in great distress? Yes. You see, yes, when God is against you, there's going to be great distress. But here's the plan of God and the promise of God. Distress is meant to lead us to cry out to God. Amen. Amen. Maybe you're going through distress in your life right now. Are you crying out to God? And now God allowed his people to be in distress. See, God is sovereign. Everything that happens, either God makes happen or he allows to happen. You remember the story of Job. 
Who inflicted Job all the pain he experienced in his life? Was it God? No, it was Satan. And yet God allowed it. Everything that happens in life, either God makes happen or he allows to happen, and he's working to turn his people back to him. Amen. Let's read on in verse 16. It says, then the Lord raised up judges. Now that's an archaic word that just simply means leaders. Amen. Who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to the other gods and worshiped them. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of their hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods, serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and their stubborn ways. Right here we find a principle of God that we as a church really need to grab and put our arms around. Are you with me right here? God allows his people collectively and individually to reach great points of distress so they will make a personal decision to turn back to him. Are you with me right here? God will not turn a deaf ear. He listens. How does he respond to the cries? He raises up a judge, a leader to deliver the people who calls the people back to God and to live righteously and until that leader dies. And when the leader dies, the people go back to their ways, the Bible says, even more corrupt. We'll find in 1 Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel is a book about leadership. If there's anything we need as a congregation right now, it's men and women who want to lead for God. It's men and women who want to say, enough with the world. Enough with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. That always causes distress. God's looking for a man that's going to go, I'm going to give myself wholly to the Lord. And God will raise up judges to lead his people. Are you with me right here, guys? And I really want to put it on your heart today as we go through this to allow the Holy Spirit to open you up to go, you know something? Maybe it's time for me to turn to God with all my heart. As a people, we need godly leadership and godly preaching of the word if we're to be able to be the true people of God. The book of Judges has incredible stories. You've got Othniel, you've got Gideon, you've got Samson. But we read a, kind of an ominous verse in Judges chapter 21, if you'll turn there. The very last book of, or last verse of the book of Judges. In verse 25. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. <laughs> now... Israel wouldn't have a king, of course, until later on with King Saul. And so there's kind of a double reference here. The idea is that Israel did not have God as their king and did not have godly leadership representing him. Are you with me right here, guys? God was not king in Israel, so everyone did as they saw fit. Where there's no leadership, there's anarchy. And where there's anarchy, there's sin. Next, after this book comes the time of Ruth, which actually takes place during the time of Judges. And a lot of times we think of Ruth, we go, oh, that's just like a nice Women's Day book or something, right? No, Ruth is actually a very important book in the Bible. The man Ruth ends up marrying is actually the second husband of an older guy. His name is Boaz. It's her second husband. Um, Boaz, and amen, older guys have hope if they want to find someone. Amen, guys. We find that with Boaz. Boaz marries Ruth, and Boaz's mom was Rahab the prostitute. Boaz and Ruth are the great grandpa and grandma of King David. Is that pretty awesome? And so Ruth's incredible because it shows the lineage to David, eventually to Jesus. Are you with me right here? See, God was working in this terrible time, in this time of distress, when Israel had no king, God was still at work. And so we're going to title our first four chapters of 1 Samuel simply this, Hope for Tomorrow. Amen. 
Our first point is sorrow upon sorrow. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we read in verse 1. There were a certain man, there was a certain man from Ramathim, a Zuphite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tahu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other, Paneah. Paneah had children, but Hannah had none. Well, we just got to stop right there. Right away we have problems, right? <laughs> God always intended for one man and one woman. And here Elkanah has two wives. Now, we need to understand that it was allowed by God. And many of the great men of God had this type of situation in these time periods. But you find something very interesting anytime someone does that. Problems. <laughs> Problems. Could you imagine being married to two or three people? <laughs> That'd be crazy. Well, you'll find as we read through this some of the problems that came up. Of course, Hannah could not have uh, any children. And we'll see that here in verse 3. It says, year after year, this man went up from, town, from his town to worship and sacrifice the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. So Eli at this time is the judge of Israel. And he's appointed his two boys as chief priests to minister with all the holy sacraments of the tabernacle. Amen. So you remember the tabernacle was the tent of meeting in the Old Testament that Moses was commissioned to build where the priests came in and they ministered to the people and found atonement for sin. Amen. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was back in the times. Moses. At this point, the tent had remained in Shiloh, and Shiloh had become the worship center of God's people. We pick up in verse 4. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Pania, and to all the sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. You ever had anyone like that in your life? <laughs> This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? See, sometimes the husband just doesn't get it. <laughs> Can you relate, sisters? Well, right here, we have a woman in great distress. And she saw the other wife having tons of children. And she was hurting. And her rival, Penia, which means red pearl, would provoke her. The Bible says God had closed her womb. Why? This is because God had a plan. And you're going to see his plan unveiled here later. You see, sometimes when we're going through a tough time, we think, what is it? Is it my sin? Is that why God hasn't blessed me? But here we see Hannah had no sin, and God just wanted to use her in a great way. We're going to look and see how Hannah responds to this situation. Because we have two different options. We can stay in bitterness, or we can get better, amen? Amen. Do you want to be bitter or better? Let's look at what Hannah ends up doing. Um, understand that she's so sad. She's been hurt by family members. She's faced disappointment. And this has happened not just one time. This was year after year. And in her mind, her husband just did not understand. In chapter 1 and verse 9, the Bible says, once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. 
Well, here the word temple, again, it's the, the temple hadn't been built yet. This is written in retrospect. But by this time, since the tabernacle had stayed at a stationary place, most likely there had been buildings kind of built around it. And so thus it being called a temple here uh, in this particular verse. But Hannah's in so much anguish at this point, the Bible says she has a bitterness of soul. But what made Hannah special? She did not quit praying. Many times we stop praying just because God doesn't answer right away. But we need to imitate Hannah who went and in bitterness of soul poured out her anguish before God. Look in chapter 1 verse 12. It says, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. <laughs> I mean, this is how passionate her prayer was. That the high priest goes, is she drunk? That's how much she poured her heart out to God. It says, and he said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. <laughs> Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel saying because I asked the Lord for him. And Samuel means heard of God. As we see this pattern in the book of Judges that we saw previously that the Lord allows people to become under great distress. Why? Because he loves them. Because he loves them. We're too independent and self-reliant to get it on our own sometimes. He loves us and this distress is in order for us to come back to him to have a relationship. God wants a relationship with you personally today. Amen. Now a relationship, it always takes two. You know, we're so excited in the church uh, at our Christmas banquet, we saw Jackie propose to Aradna, amen. <laughs> And Jackie serves so much in the back there with all the, the equipment and is just a great servant in the church. Uh, Rodna is an incredible disciple. She's got a lot of her friends out with her today, which is encouraging. But what if, what if Jackie, what if it was just one-sided? You ever think about that? What if only Jackie wanted to be engaged? Would it work? No, there, there, it takes two. There must be a relationship, amen? amen? So God wants to be close to us, but it's got to take us deciding to be close to him. What is going to make us go back to God? What's it going to take for you to rid yourself of the things that displease God and the idols that we've bowed down to and worshiped in our life? And maybe those idols could be sex, it could be money, it could be alcohol, it could be drugs, it could simply be the ministry can be an idol, <laughs> where you love the ministry instead of the creator of the ministry. <laughs> It can be career and even school, things that are good that God wants us to excel in. But they captivate our hearts and we worship them. And God goes, I need to bring great distress so that you'll come near to me. And she got in such great distress that she goes, God, if you give me a child, I will dedicate him to you. I will give him completely to you to be raised to be a minister of God's people, to be your servant and to be your prophet. She gets so desperate that she asks Eli to pray for her. All this great distress was to get this righteous woman to give her son up to train him to be the judge and the prophet, and Samuel would go on to be one of the forerunners that would unify all of Israel. Is that pretty awesome, guys? You see, sometimes we don't know what God's doing in the moment. We don't understand what he's trying to prepare us for and what he's molding us to get ready for. We think evangelism has something to do with us. But God uses his spirit to lead us in evangelism. 
And we see that with the Ethiopian eunuch when the Holy Spirit tells Philip to go and talk to him. You remember that in Acts chapter 8? And sometimes we get distressed. We don't understand, guys. God is working. He's bringing the people in our lives, and he has a plan. Everyone you know at your workplace, everyone you sit by in class, have you shared your faith with them? Amen. Amen. You know, it's going to be exciting. We're going to plan coming up soon a Bring Your Neighbor Day, and God willing, Matt Sullivan will be coming into town to speak to the church. Well, that'd be awesome. And for those of you who don't know, Matt is our overseeing evangelist who oversees all the evangelism work of the southeastern uh, United States. Amen. And also all of India, which, you know, just a few people over there, right? <laughs> Millions and billions. Does it excite us to get used by our God? We think great distress is just for non-Christians, don't we? You know how it is. You hear the people that come up here to get baptized that go, my life had fallen apart. I got in a car wreck. I was out laying in my own vomit. I woke up to someone I didn't know. And all, all these crazy, you, we hear all this stuff, don't we, all the time? And they go, and then at that moment, I cried out to God and God sent a disciple into my path. It's awesome. I mean, it's so cool seeing Jess get baptized because she was seeking after God and God sent Skyla into her life because they worked together at, in their essential oils business. Is that pretty awesome? There was a plan. God always sends a deliverer to bring his message. But we think that's just for non-Christians. So we go, once we're a disciple, we're good, right? It's all flowers and rainbows and exciting. And No, sometimes he goes, now you're a disciple. Now you're ready. Go study the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 9, he goes, Paul, I've called you to be a light to the Gentiles. I will show you how much you must suffer for my name. Yeah. It's to produce a character, a strength in us that has been lost in our modern generation. Yeah. It's to raise up leaders to lead people back to God. It's great having Miles place membership with us today before the fellowship break. Amen. Yeah. And Miles is awesome, but Miles will tell you, you know, he went through some great distress prior to moving here. Really just wrestled with some things. And that great distress, even guys sometimes in our sins, God will, can use them to his glory if we will turn back to him. And in his great distress, he goes, I've got to move to a church where I can get the support and the encouragement I need. The whole Charlotte Remnant group goes, yes, we got to do the same thing. We're fired up and it's exciting. We're going to have people trickling in from Charlotte over the next couple of months. Is that pretty awesome? <laughs> next time your relationships are hurt, your dreams are shattered, your health is hurting, God's setting you up for a miracle. Sorrow upon sorrow produces a miracle. Our second point, worldly sorrow. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Hannah's so fired up in chapter 2 that she sings a song to God. Amen. And we're not going to break down the, the whole song, but I encourage you to read it. She just praises God and sings. You see, you know you're fired up for God when you're singing. Amen. Yeah. You ever just been so happy you just start singing? Yeah. You know, sometimes my wife, you know, sometimes I sing in the shower. Amen. Yeah. Because I'm just happy. I'm fired up when I'm walking with God. I just get excited. Amen. Now, I won't sing for you guys because I don't want everyone to leave the church. Amen. It's not my gift. But you know something? Every Christian's called to sing. Yeah. And I'm just going to ask you, were you singing today? Yeah. Are you fired up? You can tell how someone's doing spiritually on if they sing for God or not during the praise and the worship. Yeah. You see, you got to be connected to God. And if you're not singing, you need to be like Hannah and pour out your soul to God and the bitterness and the anguish that maybe has captivated your hearts. Wow. You know, sometimes we can have a worldly sorrow. In 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 8, Paul writes, Even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurts you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy not because you were made sorry but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended and, were in so, and not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter, amen. Worldly sorrow leaves you empty 
and hurting. Paul goes, I wrote a letter and I'm sorry that it hurt you. Well, actually I'm not. He goes, I'm glad it led you to repentance. <laughs> Sometimes God's word is going to make us feel a conviction. It's going to make us feel guilt. It, that timing is so important because it's to lead you to God, that distress. And then godly sorrow always leads to refreshment, to joy, to excitement, because now that you've been broken, God can put you back together and you're living his plan and there's a happiness that comes in your soul. Are you with me right here? But worldly sorrow is focused on the self and goes, woe is me. I can't change. Sometimes people that are depressed, that come across sad, are actually very bitter. Now, I'm not talking about clinically depressed people. I understand. Uh, I myself have obsessive compulsive disorder. And I encourage you to read the bulletin article today. I uh, wrote an excerpt from a chapter in my book that hopefully would get published this year. Amen. Um, but, but, but for me, I understand. I still have to have godly sorrow when it comes to my sins. And worldly sorrow is so easy. It blame shifts. It blames it on others. Hannah could have gone. It's this other woman's fault. And I'm not going to serve God now. Hannah could have responded being bitter that at God because it had been year after year after year and she did not see the timing and the plan. How are you responding to God when you're hurt by the message? When you're hurt by someone discipling you? You know Peter was hurt by Jesus? In John 21, it's amazing, during Peter's restoration, Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? He challenges him, if you love me, go and feed my sheep. Right. Take care of my people. The third time he asked him, Peter, it's the Bible says Peter was hurt. And this brokenness in Peter led to him becoming one of the most powerful men of God. It transformed to a joy of his Lord and Savior. And he preaches boldly in Acts 2 before 3,000 people. Worldly sorrow always leads to death spiritually while godly sorrow leads to life. How do you know if someone has godly sorrow? They're indignant towards Satan. It says they have indignation. That means just a hatred towards Satan, a hatred towards the flesh. They go, I'm ticked off. I'm never going to let this happen again. We sometimes think it's bad to be mad as Christians. <laughs> go read John 2 when Jesus went into the temple and cleared it out. You got to be mad at your sin. You got to go, you know something? I'm tired of this dogging me. He goes, what alarm? What eagerness to clear yourself, to, what eagerness to make yourself innocent. If there's apologies that need to be made, he goes, you got to clear yourself. Are you with me right here? Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 2. You guys with me? 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 1. We're going to pick up. Obviously, that's the song I referred to that she sings. And then let's pick up actually in verse 12. And we're going to read now about Eli's sons. It says in verse 12, Eli's sons were scoundrels. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> These were the chief priests for Israel. Amen. They had no regard for the Lord. Now, it was the practice of the priest that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest servant would come in with a three-pronged fork in his hand while the meat was being boiled and would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle, the cauldron or the pot. Whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the person who was sacrificing, give the priest some of the meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the person said to him, let the fat be burned first and then take whatever you want, the servant would answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. For all of us Gentiles, and that's everyone in the room probably, amen? For all of us Gentiles, we go, okay, so they weren't letting the meat get burned up. I mean, I like my steak medium rare. What's the big deal, and why is God so angry? <laughs> well, this is actually exactly the point. They liked the way it tasted when some of the fat was left. You can study out Leviticus chapter 7, teaches that God had commanded that the fat is to be burned as an aroma pleasing 
to God. So what the leaders were doing is they were saying, no, I want the fat and I want the meat so it tastes awesome and to give it to me before it was burned, forget what the Lord said. And these were the spiritual leaders of Israel. Chapter 2, verse 29. We get a little bit more insight. He says, why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening your by the people of Israel? He goes, you're literally becoming fat because you're eating the fat from my offering and God was ticked off. We need to start laying out some things in our congregation. You know, one of the things we, we've talked about is we just had our pledge drive this last weekend, amen? Yeah. And one of the things you find is you say, Samuels, anytime someone comes and worships God, there's an offering that's given. And we also find this in the New Testament with all the collections that are taken. Are you with me right here, guys? And in our congregation, we ask every member to minimally tithe, that's just an Old Testament principle, or if they can't, to be working their way up to a tithe, to be able to give a sacrifice so no one can come before the Lord empty-handed as commanded in the Old Testament. Amen. Amen. For those of us who have been blessed uh, uh, in great ways, we give more than a tithe because we understand we're so grateful for our salvation and our sacrifice. Amen. But in our contribution, I believe the last, uh, some, the last few weeks, some of us, we've been taking some of the fat from the Lord because we like the way it tastes. We like spending the money on ourselves before we spend it and give it to God. And last week, our congregation fell bef below our pledges. Now Joe's going to be giving the contribution speech today and giving an update on our contribution. But sometimes we're spending some of our fat that's supposed to be sacrificed to God on ourselves. And it's not that God needs our money. It's not that the church needs the money. It's our pledge that we've made to God. Amen. So we asked every member to hand in a pledge card that's not so much for us, but more of a reminder for all of us of what we pledge to God and to simply give to God what we all individually decided to give to him. Are you with me right here, guys? And imagine how God would bless us. But I want you to understand, why was Israel in distress at this time? These are the type of things that were going on. That was just the type of things that were going on. Let's be honest. We've experienced some distress this last month as a congregation. Yeah. And when we got considered, the answer is not to just go, well, we need to preach less of the standards. Yeah. The answer is to go, we need to collectively repent in our sacrifice to God. Yeah. And we find here that things were even worse. Check this out. Chapter 2, verse 22. Oh, baby. Verse 22 of chapter 2, it says, Now Eli was very old and heard about everything his sons were doing to all of Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and favor the Lord and with his people. Right here, not only were Eli and his boys taking advantage of the offering, they were having sex with the women ministering at the tabernacle. These are God's people, and God's indignant about that. We've heard in the media before corrupt stories of ministers sleeping with the people in their congregation. What a disgrace to take advantage of. You see, we're all going to sin, and even pastors and preachers, we all have sin. Are you with me right here? But God has certain standards in certain places. You go, you just don't cross that line. And we've got to rededicate ourselves to God's holiness in our personal lives and collectively as a congregation. Amen. There's no shepherd or evangelist that's perfect. But there need to be standards for not only the leadership, but also the followership of God's people. We've had to address some sins in our church this last month. Um, I preached recently at our dating devotional. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, and the Apostle Paul writes here to the church in Ephesus. And he says in verse 3, but among you there must not be even a hint 
of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, meaning they love pleasure more than they love God. Has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes light. This is why it said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And the church says, Amen. you ever woken up someone and they're a little grumpy? You can ask my wife. When, when I'm tired, I am just not a pleasant person to be around. That's how it is sometimes spiritually. When you call out sin in somebody's life, they're going to be a little grumpy at first. Little challenge. And Paul writes here, he goes, among you, meaning everyone in the church has a responsibility, that we are to make sure there's not even a hint of these type of sins in our congregation. Yeah. Amen. Sexual immorality, sleeping with someone that's not your wife, or if you're single, not waiting till marriage. Uh, impurity, pornography, masturbation, lust, um, greed, being self indulgent, materialistic. He goes, we got to make sure there's not even a hint of these in our lives. Now, here's the thing. We will have sin. I have sin, and I've struggled with these sins. I've shared with you guys before. These have been sins that have been in my life at different times. And yet, for me, one of the things that was amazing is I'm so grateful that when I got married to Chanel, that white dress meant something, that I had never committed the sin of sexual immorality. And she came down. Our first kiss was at the altar. It was awesome. To my shame, I've struggled with impurity, uh, pornography and lust and all that goes with it. And one of the things that, that, that is key when we deal with these type of sins, the Bible says in verse 11, we need to have nothing to do with them, but rather expose them. You have an opportunity to confess your sin to God. And to confess your sin, James 5.16 commands to another brother or sister in the congregation. So that we can pray for one another and strengthen one another. But here's my question. Are you willing to confront sin in the lives of others? Maybe you know about something going on. Are you willing to pull them aside and talk to them about it? That's what he says. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but expose them. It's a little quiet in here. I know this doesn't get preached at most pulpits on Sunday mornings. But it's in the Bible, so I got to preach it. An idolater puts his own pleasure above God's. And that's where Israel had gotten to, and that's where the leadership had gotten to. And right here, Paul's very specific in his preaching. You know, we get loosey-goosey about the different things we watch, the different pictures we click on on Instagram and Facebook. We get loosey-goosey about the things we listen to. And as someone once said, garbage in, garbage out. What you put inside is going to be what you produce in your life. <laughs> and we need to be hard line about sin in our fellowship. Paul says among you, there must not even be a hint. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, sometimes what happens in the church, it's interesting being uh, the, pa the, the, whatever you want to call me, the lead evangelist, the pastor. Um... Because a lot of times people will come to me with sin they notice in the church. And they think they're doing the spiritual thing. They're actually hurting me. And they're hurting the person that's in the sin because the Bible says to go and talk to who? That person. I shouldn't know about things going on in the church if you haven't first confronted it in the person. But I think a lot of us, we struggle with being conflict avoiders. Because we fear people so much rather than fearing God. And when we fear God, we go, you know something? I love my brother. I love my sister. And I've seen them hurting and I'm not going to let the night come without saying something to them. What happens? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 27, Paul's writing about communion. And we're going to take communion today. 
I pray for Gianni. He got very sick. And so uh, Frank's going to stand in and lead our communion service today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 27, it says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the blood, body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That's why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. The Bible says, why are people weak? Why are they getting sick? What's going on? It goes, they got to take communion the right way. Now, I believe, again, this isn't the, the issue. We all get sick. There's germs and stuff like that. I believe this refers to as well a spiritual sickness. Yeah. Spiritual. You know what it's like to be weak? You ever been to the gym and you're just weak and you're going, oh, you can't. You, can't. you feel no strength to fight sin anymore. You ever been sick? People get worried about being sick. Why? Because it's contagious. We had some contempt and rebellion in the church that got contagious and spread it to other people and people left. Our sin has dire consequences. And he goes, guys, you're weak. You're sick. And some have fallen asleep. Some have died. Some have died spiritually. He goes, the purpose of communion every Sunday is to remember what God's done for us. What's God done for us? He's provided himself as a sacrifice for us so that we can be made clean, amen? amen? And you know, for me, if I'm doing lousy spiritually, I'm not gonna take communion in an unworthy manner. The Bible says I must examine myself. Even this morning, I was chatting back and forth with uh, Matt Sullivan, the guy who mentors me, and I was just being open with sins and feelings, I, I thought, because I want to be able to take communion in a way that honors my God. Are you with me right here? And we've lost the spiritual sense of what our time of communion is for, to remember the broken body and the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. We can't have worldly sorrow, but must have godly sorrow, amen? amen. Well, finally, let's close out here, back in 1 Samuel chapter three. All right. Come on, bro. Let's go. Our third point is sorrow, but hope for tomorrow, amen? In 1 Samuel chapter three, a little background uh, uh, at the end of chapter two, uh, a man of God comes to Eli, and tells him his house is going to be decimated because of the sin he's allowed in his life and the life of his family. Amen. When we don't deal with sin in our own families, it has consequences for our lineage. Are you with me right here? Yeah. And he says here in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. And this could be said of our day, could it not? There's not much vision anymore to transform the world for Christ. There's not much vision anymore to have an impact. Why? The Bible says the word of the Lord is rare. I, I love, I work on the campus ministry. I love being at Harvard. I love being at Boston University. I just kind of jump around and circuit around uh, doing Bible studies with people. But there's an increasing, increasing doubt and contempt towards the Holy Scriptures. Well, I think it's just kind of up to how you think about it. And I like the things about heaven and grace. Uh, hell, that's probably a myth or something. That, that's what people do. We become gods to ourselves. I studied the Bible with a young man the other day, and, and, and he wanted to, to, to quit studying the Bible. He says, I'm a Christian, and, but I just don't believe in the Bible, really. I go, so how do you know what to do? Because well, I believe he believes some parts of it, but just not others. Is God a God of confusion? Sometimes we just got to dumb it down. You know what I mean? We, we get too smart for our own good. The Bible says knowledge puffs up. Trust me. I, I, I went, I took a class at seminary. They call it cemetery. But you go in there and they kill your faith. <laughs> Why are people not changing the world? Because they're stuck in these classrooms, learning a bunch of theology, but they're not willing to get out there and make a difference. Not willing to get out there and preach hope. Hope for tomorrow that this world can literally be different. And the word 
was rare, and the result was not much vision. Verse 2, one night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The book of Samuel is kind of showing us something symbolic here, that Eli's eyes were becoming so weak, that represents the vision of all of Israel at the time. It was so weak at this point. And it says in verse 3, the lamp of God had not yet gone out, so there's still a flicker. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where, are the ark of, where the ark of God was. Amen. Israel's light had not totally gone out. And you kind of catch glimpses as we're reading all this dark stuff. Kind of a dark, dark morning, right? We're just kind of reading all this dark stuff. But you catch this glimmer where it talks about, but Samuel was being raised in the eyes of God. There's hope. There's a flicker. You know, in verse 4, it says, Then the Lord called to Samuel. Samuel said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me? But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called, Samuel. <laughs> That's how I imagine it sounding. I don't know. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me? My son, Eli, said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And a third time the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me? Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came to him and stood there calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in all Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. <laughs> you want vision from God? You simply need to go, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is God-breathed. God speaks to us today through his scriptures. And if you're visiting with us this morning, we have an incredible study series as a church that really helps you to position yourself so that you can hear the voice of God. Are you with me right here? and see what God wants to do with you. And he goes, Samuel, you're going to have an impact that's going to make the ears of everyone tingle and all of Israel. Well, let's drop down to verse 19. Come on. It says his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant and, and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured, that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor Oops, I'm in the wrong thing, aren't I? Sorry, chapter 3, verse 19. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Bethsheba, that's north to south, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. God is beginning to raise up his next prophet. The leadership had become unrighteous. The people were allowed to be in sin. No one was taking a stand or calling it out. It's a dark, dark time, but perhaps the darkest is yet to come. Chapter 4, look in verse 1. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The, the Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as they battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to the camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh so that he may go with us and save us from the hands of our enemies. The Israelites knew, guys, that something was desperately wrong. They go, they lost to the Philistines, so let's go and get the Ark of God. Let's get God's presence. Now, you know what the Ark of God is. You guys have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark with Indiana Jones and that sort of thing? And you remember what happens to, to people in that. They, you know, they see the Ark, they die, right? And we'll actually see that a little later in the book of Samuel. Amen. But here he goes, let's get the presence of God. Look at verse 4. 
So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A God has come into the camp, they said. Oh no, nothing like this has happened before. Even the surrounding peoples were afraid of the God of Israel because they had heard about what he had done. And the Hebrew people see it and they're so fired up. They're cheering so loud that even the ground shakes. They go, God, his presence is back. Well, let's see what happens. Verse 10. Bible says, so the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. That same day, a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived there, was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road, watching because his heart feared for the ark of God. He was a little in tune of where they were really at spiritually. He goes, when the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. And Eli heard the outcry and asked, what is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old and whose eyes had failed so that he could not see. He told Eli, I have just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, what happened, my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead and the ark of God has been captured. Verse 17 has what's called a progressive distress. He first comes and Eli's sitting there and he hears, number one, Israel's fled before the Philistines? Oh no. Number two, the army suffered great losses? Number three, his two sons were killed? And the worst of all, the ark had been captured. That meant God was no longer with his people. Verse 18. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backwards off his chair by the side of his gate. His neck was broken and he died. For he was an old man and he was heavy. He had led Israel 40 years. His daughter-in-law, his wife, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by her labor pains. As she was dying, the woman attending her said, don't despair, you've given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay attention. She named the boy Ichabod saying, the glory has departed from Israel. Ichabod literally means no glory. Because of the capture of the ark of God and the death of her father-in-law and her husband, she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Truly there was no darkest hour not only did they lose and suffer loss, Eli being killed, but the ark was captured and God was no longer with his people because of their sin, there was no glory. Yet in sorrow, there's always hope for tomorrow. And we need to remember that the lamp of God was still flickering, that it still had not gone out yet. It was flickering in the soul of a young man named Samuel whom God had brought so much distress on his mom that she did not give up and kept praying year after year and went to God. You see, where it's darkest, that's where the light shines the brightest. The darker the situation, the brighter the light of God. We've gone through some dark things as a congregation. We had such explosive growth last year. And then, of course, Satan hit us. And we had some losses, did we not? And yet, even in the distress, let's not allow Satan to captivate our own hearts. Let's go, there's still a light at the end of the tunnel and God is starting that flicker that's gonna become a flame with Miles placing membership, Jess's baptism, and all the new faces we see even with us here today that wanna know the word of God. Are you with me right here? 
There's a flicker. It says all of Israel's ears will tingle. You know, all of New England will be impacted by the Boston International Christian Church. Everybody will know that we're out to define Christianity in our generation. We need to grasp and give glory to God. And now that the glory had departed, but God was not done with Israel. He was working his plan to raise up Samuel, and then after him, another man named Saul, and another man named King David. Today, let's take time to rededicate ourselves to a couple different things. Number one, rededicate yourself to God Almighty. Consecrate yourself to him. Rededicate your heart to him. Secondly, we need to rededicate ourselves to the church. It's the body of Christ. We need to be committed to it, and we need to have a reverence for its holiness. Time to stop missing meetings of the body. Time to start talking about the church in a way that's contemptuous. It's time to go, you know something? I'm going to be committed to making Christ's name great in this body. So number one, we rededicate ourselves to God. Number two, we need to rededicate ourselves to the church. And number three, we need to dedicate ourselves to the mission of Christ. There's so many lost souls out there. And we sometimes get so focused on what's going on in our own lives that we forget that there are thousands among thousands among thousands of people that are in distress crying out trying to find God. Fourthly, we need to rededicate ourselves to discipleship. We need to be in each other's lives. Every member of the church, we encourage to have a weekly discipleship time. I mean, Sal and I just had such a great discipleship time yesterday. We got in the word of God. We challenged each other. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens one another. And it was just awesome to come out feeling more close to God. Are you with me right here? You see, we've got to have weekly discipleship times. And we have practiced in the congregation. We believe Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 through 13, that we should have daily fellowship with one another. Amen? You know, today we're going to see the Patriots, God willing, have a great victory. Amen? And you know, whether it's distress... And God uses it to lead Boston to God. Amen. We got to prepare ourselves. <laughs> or whether there's great victory and God uses his kindness to lead people to God. Amen. We got to be fired up. And you know, we were watching last night uh, a, a program called uh, Tom and Time that's on um, uh, Facebook about Tom Brady. Come on, Tom. Awesome. And Tom Brady said this that I thought was really good for us as a church. He says, when you have a group of people that you surrounded by that hold each other accountable every moment of every day, those are the kind of teammates you are looking for. This is a secular thing. And he understands the power of discipleship. God, what if we had that type of conviction and loyalty to one another in the church? See, I believe we're going to have a great Super Bowl regardless of the outcome, because God's in control. And we need to say, speak, Lord, today, for your servant is listening, because there's great hope for tomorrow. God bless. Thank you.